Good evening, church. Our scripture reading, our first scripture reading is taken from the book of 1 Kings, chapter 19, verses 1 to 15. 1 Kings, chapter 19, verse 1. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there, while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. And at once an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled forty days and forty nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face, and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said to him, Go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael king over Aram. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hello. Our second reading is from the book of Psalms, chapter 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. 
Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At his sacred tent, I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hear my voice when I call, Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me, God my Savior. Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Teach me your way, O Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. Do not turn me over to the desire of my foes, for false witnesses rise up against me, spouting malicious accusations. I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our gospel portion is from the gospel according to Luke, chapter 8, beginning at verse 26. Jesus restores the demon-possessed man. Please stand as we hear the good news coming from Jesus the Messiah. They sailed to the region of the Gerasenes, which is across the lake from Galilee. And when Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but had lived in the tombs. And when he saw Jesus, he cried out, and he fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the Most High God? I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had commanded the impure spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had seized him. And though he was chained hand and foot and kept under guard, he had broken his chains and had been driven by the demon into solitary places. Jesus asked him, What is your name? Legion, he replied, because many demons had gone into him. And they begged Jesus repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. A large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. The demons begged Jesus to let them go into the pigs, and he gave them permission. And when the demons came out of the man, they went into the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When those tending the pigs saw what had happened, they ran off and reported this in the town and countryside. And the people went out to see what had happened. And when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people how the demon-possessed man had been cured. And then all the people of the region of the Gerasenes, they asked Jesus to leave them because they were overcome with fear. So we got into the boat, and he left. Now the man from whom the demons had gone out begged to go with him, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return home and tell how much God has done for you. So the man went away and told all over town how much Jesus had done for him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Okay, good evening. Um, Tonight we're going to be looking at these passages and looking at contrasts, and I'll point them out as we go along. Now, if someone said to me, what's the most exciting chapter in the Bible, 
in the Hebrew scriptures, I would say apart from Psalms, I would choose 1 Kings 18. We've just heard read uh, 1 Kings 19. In order to understand 1 Kings 19, we need to understand 1 Kings 18. We need to know what went before. So my husband Roy is going to read some of 1 Kings 18 so that we get this in context. This is from 1 Kings 18, beginning at verse 20. And Elijah has just challenged Ahab. So Ahab sent for all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together on Mount Carmel. And Elijah came to all the people and said, How long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal follow him. But the people answered him, not a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I alone am left a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Therefore, let them give us two bulls and let them choose one of the bulls for themselves, cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood but put no fire under it, and I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood, but put no fire under it. Then you call on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. So all the people answered and said, that's well spoken. Now Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose one bull for yourselves and prepare it first, for you are many, and call on the name of your God, but put no fire under it. So they took the bull which had given them, and they prepared it, and they called on the name of Baal from morning even till noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice. No one answered. Then they leaped about the altar which they had made. And so it was at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he's meditating, or he's busy, or he's on a journey, or perhaps he's sleeping and must be awakened. So they cried aloud and cut themselves as were their custom, with knives and lances, until the blood gushed out of them. And when midday was past, they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening service. But there was no voice, no one answered, no one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, Come near to me. So they all came near to him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took twelve stones, according to the number of the tribes of the son of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. Then with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench around the altar, large enough to hold two seers of seed. And he put the wood in order, cut the bull in pieces, and laid it on the wood. And then he said, Fill four water pots with water, and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and the wood. Then he said, Do it a second time. And they did it a second time. And he said, Do it a third time. And they did it a third time. So the water ran all round the altar, and also filled the trench with water. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me that this people may know that you are the Lord God 
and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and it licked up the water that was in the trench. Now when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. So they seized them. And Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and executed them there. These are the words of the Lord. So here in this passage, God demonstrated who he is. I would love to have been there and seen that when the fire came down from heaven and not just consumed the bull, but the water and everything. And it must have been amazing. But I want to point out this is the first contrast. The power of God and the lack of power of the prophets of Baal. One man against 450 prophets. That's the contrast. But what happened next? We read in 1 Kings 19 that Ahab went and told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and also how he'd executed the prophets of Baal. And then Jezebel sent a message to Elijah saying, so let the gods do to me and more so if I don't make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow at this time. So now we have three people in this verse, Ahab, Jezebel, and Elijah. So who are these ancient people? Well, Ahab was the king of Israel at that time. Jezebel was his wife. She was also a princess. She was the daughter of the king of Sidon. Who was Elijah? Well, he was a nobody. No one really knows much about him. Nothing, really, in the sight of the world. But note the contrast, the background of the players, a king, a queen, and a nobody. Elijah's name means, my God is the Lord, which is very appropriate when you think of what happened through this man. So what did this great queen say to Elijah? She said, so let the gods do to me and more so if I do not make your life as the life of one of these by tomorrow about this time. So Elijah had just seen God do the absolute spectacular. And she said that and he ran for his life. Why did he do that? Well, if we look at verse 3 of that chapter, it says, when she said it, it says, and when he saw that. He saw in his mind what he thought she was going to do. And through seeing that, when she says, I'm going to make your life like, I'm going to kill you, in other words, it caused him to have a panic attack. Something awful happened to that great man of God at that moment. It reminds me of a poem. You'll have to excuse me. It is a children's poem, but I have been in education for many years. <laughs> so this is what it, what it is. It's called the What If Poem. Last night, while I lay thinking here, some what ifs crawled inside my ear and pranced and parted all night long and sang that same old what if song. What if I'm dumb in school? What if they close the swimming pool? What if I get beat up? What if there's poison in my cup? What if I start to cry? What if I get, what if I get sick and die? What if I flunk that test? What if green hair grows all, of, all over my chest? What if nobody likes me? What if a bolt of lightning should strike me? What if I don't grow any taller? What if my head starts getting smaller? What if the fish don't bite? What if the wind tears up my kite? 
What if they start a war? What if my parents get divorced? What if the bus is late? What if my teeth don't grow straight? What if I tear my pants? What if I never learn to dance? Everything seems well, and then the nightmare what ifs strike again. Have you ever experienced that? About 3 a.m. in the morning, the what ifs come into our minds. What if this happens? What if that happens? What are your what ifs? I've heard them many times in the night. So we can imagine then what was in Elijah's mind when he said he saw that. I think probably what it would be, what if Jezebel tortures me? And what did Elijah do in his panic? He ran for his life. And he prayed to God that he might die, which is very interesting since Jezebel was threatening to kill him. And then he was praying to God that he might die. So he really wasn't thinking straight. The panic attack caused him not to think straight. Have you been there? Have you experienced that? When fear takes a grip and you're not thinking straight. And Elijah then went into total self-pity at that point. Fear drove him into self-pity. He said, I am no better than my father's. So after the spectacular that he saw when fire came down from heaven and devoured that bull and licked up the water, his faith wavered and he became depressed. And what did the Lord do? Did he say to him, Elijah, pull yourself together? Did he say, get a grip, man? Did he tell Elijah how disappointed he was with him? No. The Lord kindly gave him the gift of sleep and then sent an angel to give him some food. Contrast again. Elijah's beating himself up and God is being very kind to him. And we can do that. We can, when we in fear, we can beat ourselves up, but then God speaks very kindly to us. Because the Lord understood Elijah's needs so well. The Lord understood Elijah needed to sleep and he needed to eat. I can so identify this with myself because in my job it's really stressful has been for 35 years and there's many a night when I've gone to bed and I've thought there's no way I'm going to get through this but you know what a good night's sleep I often think is like a miracle because I go to sleep and in the morning everything looks different and God knew that about Elijah that this panic attack and this fear he was in was exhausting him and he just needed to sleep he also needed food because his body was in need. God cares about our bodies. We can be so spiritually minded, we need to remember that God cares about our bodies. I once heard a testimony of a person many years ago, I was in this church and this man got up and gave this testimony. He said, I got this awful pain in my mouth and my gums were swelling up and every time I ate, I got this terrible pain. And so he, he prayed and he heard in his mind vitamin C. So he, you know, dismissed that. And then he called for the church to pray for him. And they came and laid hands on him. And then he got home and he got this terrible pain in his mouth. And his wife said to him, you know, what happened? He says, well, I, I heard vitamin C, but that's not God, is it? And she says, well, why don't you take vitamin C? And he did, and his gums cleared up. <laughs> and he gave this testimony about sometimes we can hear something from God, and it's so practical that we reject it. <laughs> because we're looking for the super spiritual, the spectacular, when God is telling you something very, very practical, and that's what happened with him. God uses the ordinary. We don't have to be super spiritual we don't have to be always expecting the spectacular. God moves in the ordinary. And Elijah was beating himself up 
And the angel of the Lord came and spoke very kindly to him and said, Arise and eat. And some food was given to him. What food it was, because in that food he went 40 days and 40 nights. I'd love to have seen that food. <laughs> Elijah then went and hid in a cave. Ever been there when you're in fear? I just want to be on my own. Okay, that's where he was at. He was afraid and he just wanted to be on his own, away from everyone. And in the cave, he hears the voice of God. A question, what are you doing here, Elijah? What a kind question. Not, where's your faith, Elijah? Remember the wonderful faith he had when I sent fire down from heaven and consumed the bull? Where's it gone, Elijah? No, that wasn't the question. The question was, what are you doing here, Elijah? And what does Elijah answer? Well, I've been very zealous for the Lord of hosts, the children of Israel, they've forsaken your covenant, they've torn down your altars and killed the prophets with the sword, and I alone am left, and now they're going to take my life. He had forgotten the power of God. It was all about him. We can be like that. It's all about me and my problem. But Elijah actually was not telling the truth to God. He was actually running because he was afraid of Jezebel. There's nothing better than coming before God and having a heart-to-heart, -heart, open, honest talk with God because he knows what's in us anyway, instead of saying what we think he wants to hear. The Lord knows anyway. We just need to speak it out. This is where I'm at, Lord. I'm sorry, but this is where I'm at. So why are we so shocked when trials and tribulation comes? Why, why was Elijah so shocked when, when Jezebel did that? Well, the Apostle Paul deals with this. The Apostle Peter, sorry. He says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by our brotherhood in the world. When we're in that place of fear <clears throat> and we feel alone, we need to remind ourselves that this is not unique, that the same sufferings are being experienced by our brothers and sisters in the world. It's nothing new. But when we go through it, we are surprised and we hate it because we were never created for suffering. We were created for blessing. So when suffering comes, it goes against the grain. Elijah had seen God operate in the spectacular with the prophets of Baal, and so he was expecting the spectacular again. But the Lord didn't come in the spectacular. He didn't come in the earthquake. He didn't come in the wind. He didn't come in the fire. God sp spoke as he does to us quietly in the still small voice or the Bible reading was a delicate whispering voice. Another contrast, the shouts of Jezebel, the shouts of the enemy and the still quiet whispering voice of God. A person with real authority doesn't need to shout. So, have you heard his whisper? Have you heard the still small voice of God? Have you heard the whisper of truth? Have you heard the whisper of love? The whisper of quiet authority? Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, and his voice is gentle, quiet, and reassuring. God is with us. And twice the Lord asked Elijah the same question. What are you doing here, Elijah? If we had a time of quiet now, what do you think God would be asking you tonight? What's the question he would be saying? The voice of the enemy threatens us 
in many different forms. But our defense was the psalm that was read, Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this I shall be confident. This is a powerful proclamation. I have to say, this is, I was saying to someone today, as a new Christian, years ago, this was the first passage I felt the Lord tell me to memorize, Psalm 27. And I found it to be a powerful, powerful proclamation when fear starts to come in. Because it says, though an army may encamp against me, my heart will not fear. So let's go on to the gospel reading now. Jesus is confronted by a man totally demonized, and the man, and if it says, he spoke out in a loud voice. Note the loud voice of the enemy. He spoke out in a loud voice to Jesus, and he told him that his name was Legion, an army. What a fearful sight that must have been for the people to see this man running up and shouting that out. Was Jesus impressed? No. I can imagine his response when he told him, you know, I'm an army. So? God was not impressed by the prophets of Baal when they shouted and cut themselves. Jesus was not impressed by an army of demons. In fact, the opposite. His concern was for the demonized man that he be set free. Contrast here, an army of demons and one person, Jesus. The demons were seeking to wreak havoc and Jesus was seeking to bring peace and healing. Interesting, what I find interesting about that passage of what happened there can you imagine those demons trying to hold that man back when Jesus stepped onto the, fl the shore? That's the power of his free will. They couldn't hold him back, and he ran to Jesus' feet. An army of demons couldn't hold him back. The enemy wants us to feel powerless and helpless, but that is not true when we cry out to the living God. Peter tells us, be sober, be, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So this roaring lion that's very loud is going around seeking whom he may devour, and we hear it in fear and confusion and panic. But the Lord isn't impressed by the roaring lion. He wasn't impressed by an army of demons. He was not impressed with the threats of Jezebel. Jezebel was an idolater. She was power hungry. She sought to destroy anyone who crossed her. But God is with us. And Paul, in the book of Romans, reminds us, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, he is with us. We can read 1 Kings 18 and we can see the spectacular. We can imagine that fire coming down from heaven, devouring the bull, licking up the water, everyone falling on their faces, and we can be in awe of Elijah. In fact, we even sing the song, These are the Days of Elijah. But you know, James, the book of James, tells us an interesting thing. Elijah, he says, was a man with a nature just like ours. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it didn't rain in that land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. That's pretty amazing. 
Isn't that reassuring? Elijah was no different to you and me. And yet, the Lord did through him the most spectacular thing. Through his prayers, it didn't rain all that time. And then through his prayers, it did rain. And James says he was just an ordinary man like you and me. So let's be encouraged and know the full understanding that God is with us. And now I'm going to the final contrast in these passages. The ending of Elijah and the ending of Jezebel. Elijah left this earth on a chariot of fire. Jezebel was eaten by dogs. The demons in the gospel reading went into pigs and ran violently down a steep slope into a lake and drowned. Interestingly, they went into the, a lake because the devil and his angels will finish up in a lake of fire. And the demon-possessed man, he was healed. He was seen clothed in his right mind. He was sitting at the feet of Jesus. He went away with joy, proclaiming the wonders of what God had done for him. And we as believers, we have an incredible hope and a future. Let's remind ourselves of that fact. When the voice of fear starts to come in, or the what-ifs in the night, we need to remind ourselves of who God is and who we are in his sight and remind ourselves, if God be for us, who can be against us? And remember Elijah, one man on his own, but God was with him. Let's not allow the enemy to impress us. Don't be impressed. Let's be those who are thoroughly impressed with the power of God. Let's pray. Lord God, help us to be people who are preoccupied with you. Preoccupied with your power. Preoccupied with your love, your grace. May we face every trial and tribulation, every difficult situation with the truth that you are with us. We are never alone and you're not impressed by the enemy of our souls. Amen. Going to hear a testimony and then uh, pray to remind all of us, even though we're getting bored and some of us are getting weary of hearing the news, there's still a horrible, horrible war going on in the Ukraine in which one Christian nation is attacking another Christian nation. And the Ukraine, along with Poland and Belarus, the Baltic states, has had a very, very tragic recent history. In fact, one famous historian even wrote a book and called it the bloodlands. And so this is uh, reminded us that this was the area occupied by Germany, occupied by the Soviets, reoccupied by Germany, reoccupied by the Soviets. And uh, in this strip of Europe between Stalin and Hitler, 17 million people were murdered in cold blood, including millions of Jews. And uh, so with that, con with that history, that context, and with what continues today, I'd like to make sure that uh, we, as praying people, don't get weary um, and don't get bored and move on to to other things. And so recently, one of our 
one of the members of our congregation, Caleb, Caleb uh, was in Poland to minister to Ukrainian refugees. And I'd like him to just give us a short report and uh, then we'll pray into his report and to pray into some of the uh, prayer requests that we have received uh, both locally and internationally. So. Thanks, Pastor David. Well, <clears throat> earlier on, before I came to share, um, Pastor David was speaking to me and telling me, like, um, think of a few names to share about. Um, but it's quite hard because when you're there, people really just come and go, and you see a lot of people coming and going. You know, my namesake, Caleb, I'm here to give a good report, or at least I'm trying to give a good report of what's happening there. It's not easy. Um, I was serving at a refugee camp at, at Tesco's. Well, it was a Tesco's until it was repurposed into a, a big hall just to house, um, uh, you know, it's like the big section of the Tesco's where you have um, all the aisles, but all the aisles are cleared out, and so it's just replaced by beds, and so all the refugees are staying there. Outside the Tesco's, you, usually you have like stores, like a, you know, a hairdresser and all that. And these um, little cubicles um, had flags outside of them and they had refugees inside. So each of these flags represented a nation that, this, that these refugees would want to go to. So you sleep in that room. The next day, someone would come and tell you, okay, there's a bus. It's going to bring you to Sweden, to Amsterdam, to the UK, to US, all that sort of thing. The whole world is there to help, right? Um, it's a good thing, right? But it's also easy to forget that, you know, this is just one of the many conflicts that's happening around the world. Um, fortunately for the Ukraine, this is one conflict that the world cares a lot about. Um, there are many conflicts around the world that not many people care about. Um, I just wanted to share maybe a few stories um, just to put faces behind the, um, the conflict that's going on. When I was there, there was, you know, there were people that we would, you know, we had these little cards that we printed up. Um, it had a Ukrainian flag on it, and in Ukrainian words it would say, do not be afraid, I am with you. And at the bottom it says, Jesus. Um, it's not the same when you're doing evangelism in a place like that versus like doing evangelism in the U.S. or wherever you come from. Everyone that I gave that card to looked at it, they would read the words, and I would see people, you know, stare at it and they would cry because they knew that this was, you know, it changed everything for them. Um, I was part of a team, we weren't very sure, I wasn't very sure what I was doing there. Right? I came on the request of a friend who told me and said, we need worship, uh, worship leaders and evangelists. You know, you would think to yourself, maybe you're going there to minister to people, to like, you know, fold blankets, to do laundry and stuff. Uh, not so much to play guitar and to stand in the corner, but that was basically what I was doing. I was playing guitar and just worshiping the Lord. Um, and the thing is, people responded to that because there was a deeper need than just a physical need. People were hurt, but people were also receiving, they were feeling the Holy Spirit um, there and they were responding to the message. So we had people who would come up and preach the gospel, like a short two-minute, three-minute sermon, and people would give their lives to, to Christ, you know, like four or five people at a time. Um, we had friends who would get, get on the buses with the refugees who were going out of um, Ukraine or going out of Poland to Ukraine, um, ferrying them back to, like, safe houses and all that, who would preach the gospel on the buses, and many people would come to the Lord through that. Um, people who would get on planes who preach the gospel in the planes and, you know, um, people would give their lives to Jesus on those planes as well. Um, but the most important thing for me um, was this, there was this one moment when a, a man came up to me um, as I was playing the guitar and I had a friend who told me, I said, play a song for him. I said, okay, like, what, do you, what am I supposed to play? I played the song for him, you know, Still by Hillsong. When the oceans rise and thunders roar, I will soar with you above the storm. Um, and that was a song I sang for him. I don't know if he was a believer or not. One thing you must know is that a lot of people, they're Orthodox Christians. They believe in this concept of God, but they haven't had a personal relationship with him. 
And so after I sang the song, I told him, I said, the song is for you, right? These are the words of the song, and this is who, this is what God is saying to you, right? That in whatever situation that you're in, he stays with you, right? And he was moved to tears. He started crying. Um, I had a friend who was with me, translating for me. We prayed for him, and he said he wanted to give his life to Jesus. That's the sort of thing that happens, you know. Um, it's not... Uh, all bad news. Um, I mean, it is bad news, but there is also a lot of hope. And the hope that we have is the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. So as we're there praying for people, ministering to them, many of them were putting their lives in Jesus because they were hearing the gospel, not so much in the same sense that they, hear, they heard it from their church, but it was the gospel of a Messiah, a Savior, right, who was there for them in a moment of need. Yeah. Isn't it wonderful? A brother from Singapore goes to Poland to minister to Ukrainian refugees. And so preaching the gospel is not just about getting saved, but it's the message that God is with us. And that's why at the beginning of Luke's gospel, the angel can say, do not fear. And at the resurrection, Jesus can say to his disciples, do not fear. God is with us. But God, God has taken on flesh in the person of Jesus, the Messiah, to come and share our life and to ultimately to rescue us. Holy.